اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه في الأولين وفي الآخرين وفي الملء الأعلى يا رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى تعبالي So we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send peace and blessings upon Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Upon his family, his companions and those who follow them until the end of time It's a pleasure to be with you again Seems like mashallah every few months Um Every time we meet, there's a pandemic, you know. So hopefully, like this time, uh, we'll be able to continue uh, our our meetings, inshallah. And uh, it's an honor to be invited, especially by young people, right? Um, as Muhammad and I were having fun in the car, everyone should ask Muhammad what he wants to do when he grows up. By the way, it's an inside joke uh, between me and him. Um, but like, you know, to see uh, young people organizing. You know, in the face of a lot of different challenges that you face, especially as Muslims, uh, and to come together and like put on these kind of events, uh, it's really uh, invigorating and inspiring. And just want to say, you know, it's humbling also uh, to be asked to come. Uh, alhamdulillah. Uh, we're going to be spending some time, maybe the next few visits, inshallah, talking about the 49th chapter of the Quran. So when I come, it's good if you bring like a copy of Quran with you so you can take some notes. Uh, for yourself, inshallah. The 49th chapter of the Quran actually was the last chapter revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The last entire chapter. So it's coming, you know, 13 years in Medina, 10 years, uh, 13 years in Mecca, 10 years in Medina. This is coming in like the 10th year. Um, some, you know, scholars of Quran note like the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa wasn't that far after uh, this chapter was sent. This chapter is called Surah Hujurat. Hujurat is a plural for Hujra. Hujra means an apartment, like a small room. So this is talking about the apartments of the Prophet Arihi Salatu Salam. If you've ever been to Medina, and as you're walking into the masjid, if you see the Rauda to the left of it, where the grave of the Prophet is, Arihi Salatu Salam, Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar, you see like this large green curtain. Right, that large green curtain towards the back are where some of the apartments of the Prophet's wives were. And if we were in the masjid, I could show you where it stops. There's actually a marker on the ceiling that shows you where those apartments stopped. That was called the Hujarat. Hujarat to Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the apartments of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another name that's given for this chapter, and this is why we're going to go through it together, is Surat Al Adab. Adab means etiquette, character. We live in an age now where character is an endangered species. If you're watching TV at night and they say, like, this polar bear is about to be extinct or this type of parrot is about to take an exit they should also add character Al-Adab, Sayyidina Ali used to say Innam Al-Adab Huli Yatim that character is actually an orphan there's no one to look after it, it's just running around so this chapter really focuses on character and we know for us as Muslims character is very important the Prophet peace be upon him said the closest of you to me in the hereafter are those who have good character. And character is kind of like what the brother was saying about the name of Allah. Character is something that we're all responsible for. How I carry myself, how I act, how I treat people, how I engage with my mom and dad, how I treat my friends at school, how I engage in the streets. By the way, I don't have a problem with babies. I have a, I have a two-year-old and I have a baby on the way. So this is good training. I have a 20 year old too, which means my life is freaking crazy. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, I have a two year old and I have one on the way. So I just want to encourage, because I know moms, babies welcome, right? And nobody look at people with babies if their babies are making noise. Don't look at them like, right? Like you're on the end train or something. <laughs> because that's not good character. It's very difficult being a mother, it's very difficult being a father. So we want to make sure everybody feels welcome here. That's good character. When people walk in, they feel like they're valued. And we were all babies. 
One of the greatest scholars of Islam, Imam As-Siyuti, he actually, as a child, was playing around in the masjid. I'm going to say this now, and for this baby, inshallah, I'm going to do the same thing. Yeah. Exactly. So, <laughs> Imam, I don't speak uh, Bosnian, bro. Imam in training. Yeah. So, well, Imam Asiyuti, he used to go to the big mosque in Egypt with his mom. He was an orphan, yeah. and he used to play in a mosque, in this big mosque called Jami' Ibn Tulun in Cairo. And one time, a great scholar, Ibn Hajar, he was teaching hadith. And that child was making noise. That was Imam As-Siyuti. Imam As-Siyuti, he was an orphan. So then Imam Ibn Hajar, he, he became like, who's that? Hey, what are the, who's that kid, right? And they were like, Hada Ibn Siyuti, the orphan. He said, I see the light of the Prophet in this baby's face. So he said, I give him all my ijazat and hadith to him. So I give all my asanid to your baby. So I'm going to give you my email, you email me, all the, between me and Bukhari, only 14 people. So I'm going to give that to this baby, right? That's how we want parents to feel, right? Our community is, is, is sometimes very unwelcoming to people, but we live in New York. I saw a kid get shot in front of the masjid a month ago in Harlem. Like, New York is hard. So we don't want to bring that hardness into the masjid. Do you try to be hard in the masjid? Like, what kind of person are you? Like, yo, I'm hard. What? Yeah, today after Isha, boy, I was punking this uncle, dude. Like, hard, boy. Like, ooh, wow. Wow. Go to Queensbridge Projects and do that. Right? But you can come to the masjid and, like, be tough and hard. And so, inshallah, I'll make sure my email is given. And we'll give all those asanid to this beautiful, what's the baby's name? Khalas, Asrullah, Sayyidina Hamza, inshallah. So this chapter deals with character. Character is what's going to make you or break you, man. It's not what you know. It's not how you look. Right? It's not how many likes you have on the gram. How many people are talking your tics. That doesn't matter if you're Facebook followers. Hamza knows mine because of the fight we just had in the car. I mean, Muhammad, <laughs> right? He made me feel, I lost my memory, he was so mean to me. And I need my Jared's all. But like, seriously, I'm, I can say that none of that means anything if you're not a good person. If the people closest to you cannot say that you're a decent human being. That's why when the Prophet Ali, salatu salam, he passed away, what did they ask say to Aisha? How was he in the house? They didn't ask her, like, how long should my pants be? How long should my beard be? Can I eat a Popeye's? You know, like, is Chick-fil-A halal? You know, this, this. They asked her, what? How was he with you? She said, كان في خدمتي أهلي. Ali salam. He used to serve us. One of my teachers, mashallah, I memorized the Quran with, well, like, every time, I used to get nervous, because every time I go to his house, he'd be vacuuming and doing the dishes. I was like, man. And then my wife was like, I want to meet your teacher. I was like, oh, no, he's busy. Like, <laughs> he got stuff going on, right? <laughs> like, she's like, why can't I ever meet your teacher's family? Oh, you know, he got a lot going on. Go, so then I, you know, I said to him one day, like, Sheikh, you're always doing this. And he said, I'm always doing the sunnah. Like, that's the sunnah, as the prophet was, because of his character. So this chapter is going to focus on the core of who you are. It's going to get into you a little bit. It's going to make you and make me really start to think about who we are as people. And we live in an age now where, if you think about it, everything that's being pushed at you as young people is to make you as successfully stupid as possible. Like if you want to be famous, just be a freaking fool. If you want to go viral, you and your girlfriend, go get on a tower, your boyfriend, climb up by yourselves, take a camera, get a thousand feet above the earth, Take a picture like this, and you'll be famous. Really? What about like poetry? Bye. What about like feeding people? We live in New York City. There's a lot of people here. They're threatened with food insecurity in New York City. Okay. One day I was walking down. I live on 121st Uptown. I was walking down the street, and this brother came up to me, and he was like, Brother Salaikum Salam. 
So I, do, I said, Wa salaikum salam. Right? You don't need to make people feel uncomfortable. I just said, Wa salaikum salam, wa salahmatullahi swa Right? Cause, and then he was like, then he started speaking to me in Arabi. So then I knew, like, this dude is legit. You know, the initial salaikum salam, we got past that, and then he was like, I learned Arabic in my country. I was like, where are you from? He's like, I'm from Ghana. I found out he was Muslim. And I was like, what's going on? He's like, man, can you just buy me some shoes? And then, wallah, I looked down, that brother had no shoes on. So you got a bunch of young people running around because of the algorithms that are directed towards you that are trying to make you waste your time, think about beauty, think about six-pack abs, think about losing hair at 19, thinking about all this kind of ridiculous stuff, and you got a man that got no shoes in your neighborhood. So then you think about losing our potential, especially if we're followers of Prophet Muhammad. None of his neighbors were hungry. If he was hungry, but his neighbors wouldn't be hungry. None of his neighbors needed clothes. He may have needed clothes. So you got to be very careful at this age. I became Muslim when I was 20 that you don't get lost in all this. Eyebrows and nails. The whole entire world is about eyebrows and nails. Right? That's, Anthony Davis has shown that eyebrows don't matter. You can still be successful. <laughs> but that's how they get caught up. Not to say those things aren't important if they're compartmentalized and controlled, but when they become controlling, one of my nieces was like, my life is over. It's like, what? Dang, you, you're here. It's like, yeah, but you know, like, I messed up my eyebrows. I was like, oh my gosh. Life is over. Like, it's really that important. You don't want to be controlled like that. You don't want to be decimated by those things that don't matter that have taken you away from really achieving your potential. And that's one of the goals of the dunya is to cause you to not achieve who you can really be. And it does that by insecurity, and it does that by creating false value. And that's why the Prophet warned you. He said, Khud khamsa qabla khams, take five before five. What's the first? Your youth before you get old. Don't get caught up wasting your youth. So this chapter is going to teach us about character, man. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّمَا بُعِيثْتُ لِأُتِمَّ كَرِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ I was sent to help people achieve good character. Alayhi salatu wasalam. And he said, a person of good character will achieve the level of the awliya. A person of good character is like someone who fasts all the time and prays all night. So our character, one of my teachers used to say, our character is our capital. So Surah Hujurat, and today we're going to talk about the following things. Number one, don't rush. Don't be in haste. The Prophet said, Al ajala tu min shaitan. To haste is from shaitan. The second thing we're going to talk about is the great maqam of Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the great status of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number three, we're going to talk about a taqwa. What is taqwa? And one thing we can do to achieve taqwa, like right now, we can do to achieve taqwa. And it's not easy for me or for you. I'm not here to say I'm better than I seem. I'm, I'm someone who embraced Islam. So I have challenges just like you have challenges. Some of the guys that embraced Islam with me, I get a call, can you bail, bail me out of jail, even though they're in their 40s. Right, there's still, you just don't suddenly bling, hogwarts it and everything's fine. Right, it takes time. But what is taqwa? What is that one thing we can do? The fourth thing we're going to talk about is, is etiquette with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. An important etiquette we can all have with Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the fifth is an important principle for those of you who work with young people or you're teaching or you're, you know, working with youth in the community that everybody's not the same. Islam is not a monolith, right? Well, I, tonight I'm seeing the beauty of Islam. I just left an event that was held by Senegambian African people, right? Now I'm here, you know what I'm saying, with Bosnians, 
But the discourse is the same, subhanAllah. There may be a little, spice might be a little different, right? The flavor is different. But, but subhanAllah, the ethnicities may be different, but everyone's here because of the love of Allah. The love of Sayyidina Muhammad and the love of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu You know, in the 90s, man, we used to cry for Bosnians, man. We used to cry because what was happening, we couldn't go. Like, we wanted to go in Oklahoma. We're like, yo, we're going to Bosnia. Yeah. Going to get them Serbs, man. <laughs> Seriously, we were like this. But we couldn't do it because you go to jail. But the point is, like, the Ummah is bigger than all that. So Surah Al-Hujurat, the 49th chapter of the Qur'an, the last chapter sent to Sayyidina Nabi. It begins, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tuqaddimu bayna idayhi illahi wa rasoolih, wa taqu allaha, inna allaha samir alim. O you believers. And here it says, O you who believed. You know why? Because your belief was decreed before you, before you even existed. So it's in the past. So whenever you doubt yourself, I don't know if Allah loves me, I'm a bad person. Sometimes we hear from parents, from caregivers, from imams, from teachers, like you're a bad person, you're a bad Muslim, you're horrible, you're this, you're this. Don't matter. Allah said you were a believer before you even existed. And if Allah knew you were good enough for belief, so what? Then what everyone else says doesn't matter. One of the important qualities of a believer is healthy confidence. Not arrogance but healthy confidence. We have to get rid of this idea like, you know, to be good Muslims, like, oh yeah, I'm a good Muslim, I'm so weak, I'm not, people will eat you and spit you out. I remember there was this brother I went to college with and people would ask him, yo, you wanna smoke weed? He was like, nah, I'm going to Jannah. They're like, what, what's Jannah? And then he was like, I'm glad you ask. He would pull him in and start hooking him up with that dawah. Nowadays, I oh, don't know, I'm okay, I'm fine, alhamdulillah, I don't do that. We're very timid. Post 9-11 Muslims are very timid. Pre-9-11 Muslims, they had swagger, a healthy swagger. If Allah decreed that you're a believer, shouldn't you be confident that Allah chose you? They say that every person who's Muslim is a micro choice of the macro of the choice of Muhammad. Allah chose Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he chose you to be from his followers. So, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تُقَدِّمُوا The word لَا تُقَدِّمُوا means don't put forward. Like if I put this, قَدَّمْتْ I put it in front of me. There's a reason that this verse was sent. It's very important to know the reasons why verse was sent. So it helps us contextualize and apply to our own situation. When I was an MSA, I was an MSA president years ago. There was this brother, he always used to cuss. And then every time he would cuss, he would say, Man, I'm going to stop cussing, man. You know those kind of people? So I was in the car with him and he just started going, I was like, dang, okay, like, this is like a special day of just shaitanic vitriol. And so he was just cussing, cussing, he was like, man, wallahi, man, wallahi, bro, I'm going to stop cussing in two weeks. <laughs> and I said, wallahi, bro, wallahi, bro, you're a liar. He's like, what do you mean? I said, if you were really going to change, you would change now. He's like, you know what, you're right, man. I said to him, every time you say subhanallah, you get a tree in Jannah. Every time you drop an F-bomb, I guess you get a tree in hell, I don't know. You take out your tree. And so yeah, you pull out your tree, right? So that's actually what happened. So then we, we, were, we went to the mall, and he started cussing. I was like, and before that, he was like, subhanallah, 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 right? And then he started cussing. I was like, dude, you just pulled up some trees, bro. Like, you lost some trees. But the point is you, gotta, you can't rush this process. Anything in life that you want to do, look at it like a process and don't start from the beginning. Start from the end. How did you get there? And then trace the steps back. You know why? That means you can imagine it. If you can't imagine it, it's going to be hard to do it. So the first is don't rush, especially religiosity. How many people we saw suddenly they become religious and then two weeks later they're back in the streets? Because religion isn't like this. Religion is like that. It takes time. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told his Sahaba, don't rush. It takes time. Sometimes we see brothers and sisters who come back into the community. Maybe they were out there. 
And then suddenly we want to put like everything on them. We were having a conversation about that just earlier, right? About that brother who wants to become Muslim, but he's got to navigate some things. So people come into the community and immediately we're like, yo, why you look like this? Why you dress like that? Or why you act like that? No, man, help facilitate the process. So the first is لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ So even though they did something good, right? They, they thought, we'll do it first. We'll slaughter meat before the prayer of Eid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still corrected them. So we understand something. There's a duality to mistakes. Either going too fast or neglect. Also, there's something really cool in the Qur'an here. The word تُقَدِّمُوا should have like an object. Like don't put this in front of Allah and His Messenger. It doesn't mention that because every single one of us has something that we have put in front of Allah. So each and every one of us has to take an account of what, what am I doing wrong? What do I need to work on? The next it says, بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ In front of Allah and His Messenger. Usually when Allah mentions Himself, He mentions Sayyidina Muhammad Why? to show us the centrality of the Prophet's role in our relationship with Allah. One of our teachers used to say that the Prophet is the door to Allah, Babullah. Like whoever wants to have a relationship with Allah should follow the Sunnah of the Prophet and, and have a love and affection for Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam as he had for you. In an authentic hadith, the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, he was at the graveyard, he said, I would love to see our brothers and sisters. Waditu. I would love to see them. And they asked him, are we not your brothers and sisters? Ya Rasulullah alayhi salam. He said, no, 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 you're my sahaba. Our brothers and sisters were those who will come after us. That's you guys. The Prophet said, I would love to see them. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sometimes you feel it's hard to hold on to the way that the Prophet has taught us. It's not easy. But the Prophet Sallallahu said, Paradise for the one who believed in me and saw me. Authentic hadith. Then he said it three times, Paradise, Paradise, Paradise. He starts to say it loud. Paradise, meaning I guarantee paradise. I guarantee paradise. I guarantee paradise. For the one who didn't see me, and believes in me. How many of you believe in Muhammad? Khalas. You're in this hadith. Another narration, he said it 12 times. I guarantee Jannah. I guarantee Jannah. For those who didn't see me, lam yarani wa amanabi, but they believe in me. Alayhi salatu salam. So here Allah mentions his name, and he mentions the Prophet, to show us the high maqam and status of Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who the stones in Mecca used to send salams to him. The, asja, the trees in Mecca used to send salam to him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. An authentic narration when he would hold sand it would make tasbih in his hand. It would, the sand would say Subhanallah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah commands us, don't, don't do anything. Don't do anything out of pocket. Even if you think it's good, until you know what the teachings of the Prophet are. What taqwa and have taqwa. The word taqwa is from a word which means a shield, al wiqaya So taqwa is a shield that we put between ourselves and the anger of Allah. What makes up that shield? Good deeds, good character, and Iman. Iman, good character, and worship. If we want to achieve taqwa, we have to understand that it's not something difficult. This is sometimes where people, they make things too hard for people like, Oh man, I wish I could have taqwa, I'll never have it. Everybody in this room has a level of taqwa. Because you prayed, you're in the masjid, obviously here. There's, there's taqwa there. We just don't, we're not doing whatever we want to do. There are signs of taqwa, alhamdulillah, in our lives. I want you to understand this, that these kind of ideas like iman and taqwa, you already have it. It's just different levels of it. It's very important to know that. It's very comforting when you know that.
But how do we achieve taqwa? It's something I asked Muhammad in the car. And he was like, man, that's a good question. That's a dad question, bro. I got dad questions. I have a 20-year-old, an 18-year-old, a 2-year-old, and one that has yet to be delivered by FedEx. <laughs> that means y'all can't get away with nothing. And I'm a convert. So I know about those streets. Mashallah. From the liquor store to the liquor store. You can't escape. So subhanAllah, how to achieve taqwa? Is I asked Muhammad, I said, hey Muhammad, what's your plans for the future? You know, he gave really great answers that I'm not going to, of course, share now. But they were very, very inspiring answers, mashallah. But then I said, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking at the moment that the blood is coming out of your lungs and you're fighting for your last breath. What do you want to have accomplished then? That future. And when you start to think like this, you see something very profound. That people say religion is backwards, religion is short-sighted, religious lim religion, religion limits you. But if you start to think about the best color of bronzer that you're going to get at Sephora tomorrow, and that's all you think about all the time for the next three and a half hours, or the latest Jordan joints that are dropping, just can't wait to get those. You're going to find that actually your perspective is very myopic. It's very limited. You're actually like, a, like almost like an animal. Like a cow, the only thing you can see is food. That's why Allah says some people are worse than cows. They're more astray than cows. That's all they think about is what's next. But when you think about that last breath that I'm going to take, may Allah give us long lives. Or that you are going to experience at that moment as you're fighting for that last breath and the blood begins to choke you out and you tap out from this dunya that's the question I'm asking and when you think about that it actually expands you don't find yourself limited you find yourself like I need to do this I need to do this I gotta fix this I got my father now is 82 when I think about like, oh I gotta go make right with my dad right you start to think about things that you didn't think before so actually the irony is that in religion, death gives you perspective and gives you depth and gives you perspective. And dunya limits you and makes you shallow and stupid. It's very different because we'll talk about this in the future. The entire ethos of Islam is not what you have. That's the, that's the current, the thermostat of the dunya is set by powers that have made value, not 72 degrees, but what do you have? That's not how Islam looked at life. The fundamental ethos that operates in Islam is existence. What is a temporal existence? What's a permanent existence? And whatever is permanent is what I should invest in. And there's nothing more permanent than Allah. What's with Allah last. That's why in Surah Al-Kaf, when you read it, it doesn't say your good deeds. It says, وَالْبَاقِيَاتُ صَارِحَاتُ that those everlasting good things you do, meaning the perspective to live for something greater. Like, do we really want to die over AirPods, shoes, Zara, nice belts, hair gel, cars, M3s, football? I mean, don't get me wrong, there's a place for all that. But the important thing is, I'm not... I'm not intrinsically driven by any of that. A lot of times people come to me, we don't know why our marriage is falling apart. You asked him, how do you spend time together? Well, oh dang, I'm always on my phone. But I'm shopping for the house. Facebook market is amazing now. Stooped, Instagram for New York, oh my gosh. You ask the brother, like what do you do? Say, so, oh yeah, they're, all, they're together but they're not together. And then when they spend time together, it's Netflix and chill. Right? So then where's the time that you actually invested in one? Like, you don't even know each other. You know each other through these things that aren't actually intrinsic to your relationship. So taqwa actually is a blessing because taqwa forces me to think about a shield. And that shield is largely driven by the answer to the question that I want you to think about. When you leave tonight, 
that last breath, what is it that you want to have accomplished? And it was funny, because in the car, Muhammad asked me, he's like, well, then what about you? And I started to give the, you know, kids, wife. He's like, no, 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 that's the same thing, you check me. No, no, and then he asked me, what really matters? Because it's hard to cut through the layers that this dunya has put in front of understanding who you really are. How do you, how do you know who you really are when the word personality is a Greek word which means mask? They understood mask. mask? Yeah, personality means mask. In Greek, and everybody, we say in New York, you're fronting. Everybody's fronting. Nobody's who they really are. So then how can I be sincere? So taqwa really has so many benefits. That's why Allah says, Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed to be obedient and have taqwa, they find out a way out of any situation. It expands the horizon. It doesn't limit. It expands. Allah is the one who hears all things and knows all things. Not like how we hear and know, transcendently knowing all things. I think we can stop here. Actually, I think this is too much. Uh, but we have other lessons. We can continue, inshallah, in the future because I know long speeches are not fun. But what did we talk about today quickly? The importance of character. This chapter is going to talk about three types of character. Four, character with God, character with the Prophet, character with Muslims, character with non-Muslims. How do I treat people? You run into people like they're giving like, people a hard time. I don't know why they won't become Muslim. Because of you, dude. You're just like a jerk. And what do we talk about? Number one in that is to appreciate that Allah has chosen you to be a Muslim, man. That's incredible. As someone who had to find Islam, you're very lucky. Very lucky. SubhanAllah. The second is... Don't rush. Try to break life down into, like, I like to tell people, look at everything you want to do like a box of cereal. And then what are the ingredients? Like, what is it that you're going to do? And usually with people, we, when they start doing that, they're like, oh, I don't want to do that, though. Yeah, so you don't want the cereal. You just want to talk about it, but you don't want to do it. The third thing that we talked about is the maqam of Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The great status of the Prophet. If you can't do anything, just make salawat. Wallahi, if you find yourself sometimes you're down, you're struggling, whatever, just say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Allah says, Li yukhrijukum min al-dhulumati ila nur. If you send salawat upon the Prophet, Allah will take you into nur, take you into light. And then we talked about the meaning of taqwa. And importantly, we talked about why that verse was sent is because people in the name of good weren't patient. They wanted to rush. They wanted to do the biha <laughs> before the salah. And they came, look what we did. It's like, no, that's wrong. So we'll stop now, inshallah. If there's any questions about anything, uh, we'll turn it over to you guys, inshallah. Um, any questions, comments from the brothers and sisters? If I could have somebody uh, iterate with Brother Imam Fraser that what he said in Nashiazik to my cousin, he doesn't speak English. He's a translator. Yeah. What, the whole, the whole thing? Like a brief. Yeah, after. Yeah, after no problem. Yeah, uh, That's amazing. Uh, yeah, Thank you, man. Thank um, you for that. So, so every day there's new challenges, there's new ideas, there's new things going on. Yeah, I mean, it depends. Like, one of the best things you can do is ask people who have experience in the things that you're trying to do. Right? So the Prophet وسلم, in the Battle of Uhud, when he wanted to put the army in one place or Badr, the, the people who were skilled in war, they told him, no, no, don't put it there, put it here. So he listened to them, the well, in the Battle of Badr. So first is like, we look for the, like, just because someone's an Imam doesn't mean they know about clinical psychology or aerospace physics or influencing or right they don't they, they know about being an imam so it's important to go to the people who have experience and are good people in what we're trying to make choices for 
Um, a good example is that Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, he, he saw the adhan in his dream. But we never read about Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu making the, the adhan. Why? They have a nice voice. So the Prophet finds the person who has the good voice is the one who does it. Sayyidina Bilal and Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, the blind man. So that's, that's the first thing is who has experience in this, this decision that I need to make that I can talk to. If it's in, in, in NFTs or crypto, I talk to someone who understands that. Right? If it's childcare, what, sh what schools are good for my kids, let me find someone that has experience in that. So finding the right person is very important. The second is that's why the community is important. Like there's so many best practices in this room right now. I guarantee you every young person in this room can tell us how not to give a khutbah. <laughs> that, that's an advantage. So I remember when I was an imam, I'm not imam, I quit a long time ago. But when I went to Boston, I asked young people, what's the worst way to give a khutbah? Then I wrote that down. Right? So they, I learned from them, worst habits. So having a community, maybe a parent, a support group that's similar age, similar kind of professional you know, experiences that share best practices. And then of course, you know, when it comes to religious issues, having like the, the imam, you know, someone you can run some ideas off of, that's also very important. So surrounding yourself with resources. I like to tell people, I know who you are if you tell me who you know and who they know. That tells me a lot about you, right? And, and how you're able to scale. Think about like scaling things you want to do. What are the resources you need to scale? Um, why'd you quit being imam? That's a hard job, bro. <laughs> the problem with being imam is because everybody thinks something that you're not. Right? Either they hate your guts, like they want to kill you for something you didn't do, or they think like you're like a saintly person. You know, it's like, I hate the New York Giants for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm a Celtics fan, I hate the Knicks. Right? And they're like, oh, how, how can I like, hey, you like the Celtics, like stuff for Allah, right? So it's like always being like, and then being a convert is then you add that to it. I was just like, yo, man, I, 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 I'm a normal person, right? I'm a normal person. Another question that was, that was asked on the news is why, why did you convert to Islam in the first place? Uh, my friend was Muslim in high school, uh, one of my friends. And then there were some people I worked in the music business in production who used to have a Quran in the studio. So we used to smoke a lot of weed. And of course, read the Quran. What else did you smoke a lot of weed? That was before I was Muslim. That was before I was Muslim. And then I, I picked it up. I was like, Abraham, Mary? This is, this is Muhammad Bible? Like, dang, Muhammad's Bible got, I thought it was like, just about, like, you know, Muhammad's the greatest. Like, that's what I thought it was. And I read it, and I was like, wow, this is like beautiful, man. And then that, like, you know, Allah guides who he wills. Alhamdulillah. Before I was Muslim. <laughs> Before I was Muslim class. Okay, jump in. So, but is there any a trigger that you know the was the reason to yeah. raise Islam? That's a good question. I think for me, again, it goes back to it was a process, right? I read the Quran for like three. I had a girlfriend. I remember telling his girlfriend before I was Muslim, <laughs> and I was like, and she was like, "Why don't you eat pork or drink?" I was like, "Ah, oh, Muslim." She's like, "You're not Muslim. You got a girlfriend." I was like, "No, I'm Muslim." <laughs> and, and, and then, yeah, I was like, I don't eat pork, I don't drink, I don't smoke weed. And then she's like, my uncle, subhanAllah, look how Allah works. She's like, my uncle's Muslim. You, the way you live, it's not how Muslims live. You gotta change yourself. Imagine like a non-Muslim gave me dawah. Wow. Imam. <laughs> I was like, look who's talking. She's like, but I don't want to become Muslim, you do. Like, so, so it was a process. Allah blessed me with the right people at the right time. Kind of the question earlier about making decisions. Uh, Allah SWT will furnish for you sometimes things that you need to do. So it was being around sort of the right wrong people. <laughs> I guess we describe like the right wrong people. Um, Allah is Kareem, alhamdulillah. So it was for me, it was like three years. It wasn't like one defining moment. And what was the. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm going to take my advantage. So, what was the, the hardest thing uh, as, as, as Imam? As Imam? Yeah. I think it goes back to what I said earlier. People trying to tell you who you, like people trying to live vicariously through you. And, and no doubt there is a responsibility to that that's hard. Like to be a good Imam, you got to be kind of like a Jedi Knight. Like you got to study 
every day. You got to make sure that you're up on top of things. You got to, and then you have to like, what's an, what's an NFT, dude? Like, what's that? You got, you got to learn what that is. Cryptocurrency. I got to figure out what that is. So like being an imam, it never stops you because your community is constantly moving and growing, right? And then young people, they have their own language, their own challenges. So it was a lot, man. You know, I don't think people understand it's a hard job. And then plus, I'm just not good enough, man. Like, you need like a really good person, you know. I, you know, we all have our challenges, right? Being an imam is like a level of commitment. It's like very, very, mashallah, um, incredible. And my focus is more as education. So I always wanted to be a teacher. But it was a great job. Alhamdulillah, it was amazing. I served a cool community, Somali community. They were like so, so incredible. In Boston, the greatest NBA team in the world. And then, alhamdulillah, you know, came here to New York. And on top of that, probably wasn't paid as, as well. No, they took care of me. What? Yeah, alhamdulillah, they took care of me. I'm not going to lie. That was good. That was nice. That was, that was better than NYU money, for real. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. In our community, that's the you know, issue with... NYU, huh? In our communities, that's one of the problems. Yeah, no, uh, okay, so I went through that. I did go through that. I did experience that initially, but then when um, Boston people reached out to me, they were like, look, we're like, we, we want to make sure you're comfortable. Right, not, not opulent, of course, it's not like that, but just like you're not worried. No blank check. Yeah, yeah, but I've been in experiences where $24,000 a year, and they're like, mashallah, we're being so generous with you. I'm like, what? <laughs> Dang, dude, like, pay my electric bill. And they're like, you know, so I agree. That, and in New York, in New York, it's more difficult because New York is so expensive. Uh, you know, unless you live in like Westchester or something and commute uh, or from Albany. But <laughs> it's a really expensive place, man. And um, so I could see it being, it's hard for communities to support, right? Especially during the pandemic, it impacted us economically in ways that are catastrophic. And then, you know, the, 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 the mosque still functioned, you know? One of the great testimonies of this, and we hope the pandemic's done, is that houses of worship still worked. Even though they were closed, people needed them. You know, so, yeah, I agree. But alhamdulillah, Boston, they, they, it, was, it was good, man. Took care of me. Good community. I'll put off the camera, then you can talk. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm 100% I'm transparent. I have nothing to hide. It was a great experience. Um, it's just, you know, being an imam is a lot. It's a lot. Whew, it's a lot of work, man. And it can be challenging, be challenging on you and your family. Imam, my, imams are never home. Right? So I, I love my wife, man. It's my best friend. Love my kids, you know. So I, I needed to, you know, be in that space. It was what's important to me. Anyone have like a question you want to ask? I was out of the go back to the things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you speak about girlfriends, girls, this and that. Uh, probably half the question had to do with like, uh, was asking about hijab. So they was asking, what would you, in the next, it'll be tying into your process, kind of. Uh, the first one is, what would you give, what advice would you give to a girl considering <laughs> hijab? Covering. That's a great question. You know, I never say anything to my daughters, my oldest. Uh, my other, they're babies, it's about diapers. But um, I think that, first of all, we understand hijab is an obligation. You know, you hear people talking about it online, and they'll say it's not, you know, whatever, man. People say everything online. I, I read somewhere that someone said, if you get vaccinated, um, you become a peacock. I read it, man, with lahi. I was like, well, it's online, you know. Oh, okay, I guess I'm, must be a peacock now, right? Um, but, you know, look at religious texts, scholars, women and male scholarship throughout history. It's an obligation. At the same time, it's important to grow into that obligation because I ain't got to do it. Right? I'm not a woman. So I think it's important that you study that, you engage it, you talk with like your mom or someone close to you, some other maybe women mentors, and you make that decision for yourself. And you make sure that you make that decision for Allah and for yourself. Because a woman, just like a man, before I'm a husband, before I'm a father, before I'm a teacher, I'm the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's how I want to, like, that's how I center my life. So what I do, I do for Allah. What I struggle, I, yo, Allah got some challenges, I struggle with it. Please forgive me, I'm trying my best. Allah is forgiving. 
And then hijab does not create the sum total of a Muslim woman's identity. There's a lot more to people's identity than what they wear, right? It's important, we honor it, we try to do our best, but it's not easy, man. So trying to work ourselves into being strong to be able to do those things. And maybe talking to other women I think is very important. You know, now the Bosnian community has been in America long enough that you have sisters who came before you in America that had to go through this experience. So you can ask them, like, how was it? What did you do? Maybe you guys can facilitate a gathering just for women to talk about some of these things. Like, how did you, you know, get into these spaces? And we ask Allah bit tawfiq, inshallah. Follow up on that was, um, it's actually interesting. He said, thoughts on wearing a hijab part time. He said, there's guys who only pray like Friday prayer and don't pray five daily prayers. So they're kind of praying part time. Is it okay to? You know, I started my Islam praying once a day. I was like, you know what? Just let me let me get. If I can get Fajr, everything else is gonna be easy. Cause you know I was new, and that was crazy. Like y'all pray five times a day? We just got Sundays, bro. Like five times a day, dude. Like it ain't basketball. We play basketball five times a day, right? So I started looking at it as a process, but I would not do something just because someone else is not doing something. You're giving them too much authority. If a bunch of people just want to pray Juma once a week, I mean, that's on them. That's not right. But that's not why I do something. I do something, and again, I think it's hard because sometimes when a sister's not wearing hijab, the family says, oh, you're shaming us. You're embarrassing our family. Really? Like, hijab is between her and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's other things that bring honor to your family. Right? You don't have to put everything, like, like being a good dad. You know, like... Don't put everything on that, that, that young woman. You know, it's because of what she's doing or one of the young men, what he's doing that the whole family is like cursed to Hades. <laughs> really? There's a whole thing here, right? But I would say it's fine to do it that way. You have that intention. You're trying to feel, you know, kind of put your foot in the water a little bit. It's a good thing. And make that intention. Oh, Allah, I'm trying to get better. It's not easy. Help me. It's okay to be vulnerable with Allah. Like, I have trouble with this. This is hard. It's a struggle. It's a challenge. Give me the strength. Help me Help me through this process. No problem. Inshallah khair. I'll tell you the other half of like, so that was like half of all the other half was around like marriage. Uh, they were like, uh, what do you suggest for someone who's having a difficult time finding a spouse that they just lower their standards? Yeah, but you know what, man, these are great questions. Like, they're half and half. It shows, like, there's a level of maturity here that's very important. Asking questions about marriage isn't cringe, because it's very important to us, because we're trying to keep it halal. And we out here dealing with, you know, Cardi B and, I don't know, Halal X and Makru Z and Lil Wayne and Lil Nas and Nas and Dua Lipa and... <laughs> Sorry, Albanians. You know, all that. All that, right? And then I'm like... And then you're telling me I can get married when I'm 30? Have you been, like, on 127th, on a Friday afternoon? Right? And these non-Muslims are not timid. Like, what's that ring mean? This lady comes, she's like, yo, what's that ring mean? I was like, hell. I said, hell. She was like, what? I mean, you got to protect yourself. Protect yourself or you wreck yourself. You got to look after your iman. So... If we're telling young people, you can't get married, don't ask about marriage, asking about marriage is cringe, why is all the time you think about marriage, you know what, none of you can get married, and then we see them in the streets, it's our fault. I have parents come to me and say, I'm not allowing my daughter to, not Bosnians or Albanians, I'm not allowing, I'm new, I gotta figure you guys out, but I'm not, I'm not allowing my daughter to marry this guy because he's from the street over in our village. Like the street? Yeah, we have that too. <laughs> oh, for real? Okay. Like the street, dude? Like the street. Like 125th, 126th. 126th is not meritable. 124th is not meritable. The only thing you can do is 125th between Frederick Douglass Boulevard and uh, Adam Clayton Powell. That's all you got, girl. It's like, there's two dudes there and one of them's four. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Allah will bless you. Just be patient. Oh. Or you say it to the brothers. Brothers too. We know. We even get it worse. 
Right? He's like, we're going to find you a great girl. You already know what that means, man. You're in trouble. <laughs> right? So, I don't know. I got to figure out the Bosnian community a little bit more before I give advice. But I do think that, in general, parents, our job is to be advisors, not supervisors. Right? So parents are like, you know, when you're on the, on the highway and it's curvy and there's like that rhetoric. How often do you hit that rhetoric? Never. That's how parents, I told my daughter, I want to parent you like that. I want to be there, but you don't feel it. Like I give you enough room to be who you, because we don't allow our children even to know who they're going to be. Like we hold them so tight that then, then when you go out in the real world, you're like, I'm totally unequipped. That's not good either, right? We don't completely abandon our kids and say, okay, mashallah, have fun at Washington Square Park. I'll see you in five weeks. Of course not, right? There's, there's guidance. At the same time, young people, you got to listen to your parents, man. Your parents have wisdom. But if there's not a healthy conversation, then it's just fighting. And that's why I think like nonprofits like mosque even have to think about how do you create like, we have a lot of child psych family psychiatrists in the community family clinicians, bring them in and teach people how to, how to talk to one another. How do parents talk to young people? How, as a young person, a lot of times young Muslims like, so you should say this to your parents, like, man, I can't even talk to my parents. That's horrible. Now, who are you going to talk to? I can't talk to my parents. And then parents are like, I don't know why they're going to other places. Because the nature of a person is to find wisdom. If they can't find it from you, they'll find it from somewhere else. So the first is like, I think we have to talk with parents like, yo, relax the restraints. And then let's be honest, we love our boys, we raise our daughters. We love our boys, we raise our daughters. That's not good. You gotta love both and raise both. There can't be a, do there can't be a double standard. And then we say, well, Islam, and we reinforce amongst young women that Islam is unfair, unjust, and slandered against them in a way that doesn't allow them to achieve utility. That's not good, man. The third is, again, it goes back to, we have to listen to what our parents say, man. It's barakah. When I was memorizing the Qur'an, my mother was not a Muslim. When I was memorizing the Qur'an, there was a part where I could not memorize anymore. So I went to my teacher, I was like, I don't, I don't know what happened. I used to memorize like, you know, half a page a day. He was like, how you treat your mother? I was like, damn, Sheikh, I hate you. <laughs> Sheikh, don't ask that question. It's like, how, how's the relationship with your mother? I was like, man, my mother's a Kafir, man. Who cares, bro? I was in my 20s. Man, my mother's a Kafir, blah, 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 blah. He was like, no, 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 no. If you don't fix that, Allah will not give you this book. So then I went home. Mom, you know, cleaning up, doing all the work, being nice, telling her I love her, getting to a, a tough conversation that we had to have about centering that relationship on trust again. Wallahi, after that, four pages a day. So like you don't underestimate and that's one of the problems of this society is it makes us question the youth, the old and see wisdom in the youth. Like really? Like let's be honest man. Wisdom lies with people that have experience. That's just how life is. It doesn't mean that other people don't have it, wisdom, but that's just the nature of the world. And now we live in a, in a consumer, because youth is consumerized. What are they selling to old people? Wear this serum, get some Botox. Uh, puff up your lips, lipo, get some hair, uh, what do they call it, plugs, jacked up in your hair, right? You'll look young again. What do they tell yo young people? You need to be older, you need to be more mature. Look, and they're making money off that. It's weird. Whereas we need to appreciate that young people teach us how to live, old people teach us wisdom. That's just how life is. But if there's no healthy conversation between the parent and the child, it's very hard to have that. It's very difficult to be. I believe in something. I learned it from my fourth, my fourth baby. I'm, my third baby, sorry. My fourth is still chilling. Isla is my, my third, two-year-old. So cute, mashallah. And Hamza, don't, don't get no ideas, though. So, you know, my first two children, when they would poop, yeah, I was like, oh, man. God dang it. Ugh. Change the diaper, you know. Whatever. But then I realized you got to embrace the poop <laughs> to create trust. Because if you can be with someone when they have pooped their drawers and you can be committed to them and caring, they will trust you when they go through the poop of life. So now 
my two-year-old, when she decides to release the Kraken, I'm like, mashallah, that is the best poop I have ever seen in my life. You know, subhanallah, what an incredible poop. Uh, you know, I'm so happy that you trust me enough to poop in front of me, right? So you start to create, I know it sounds strange, but you think about it. If you can learn to trust someone in that most vulnerable moment, then that trust will stay. Right? So I'll let you, how, I'll let you know how it goes in like 14 years. But so far, so good. Right? So we have to create trust amongst our young people. The other thing I noticed about young people is y'all don't realize we're changing too. Like sometimes we think of our parents as they're just stuck in who they are. No, 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 no. Man, this pandemic, if you are a parent, and we got some parents here, they can tell you, this was scary for us, man. What if we die and leave you? Like it's very, those are very serious things. Like the job market has really flipped on its head. The pressure to earn is incredible. Right? And then trying to engage white America on, from the outside in, that's hard. So don't think that your parents are just like who they are. Like they, they don't change. When you can appreciate the fact that even old folks change, that helps you appreciate them in a different way. The third thing is, man, don't rush getting married. And there's three things you want to think about before or four before you get married. Number one is, do you know who the heck you really are? And if you've been outsourced by TikTok and Instagram and whatever is popular, and the algorithm is what you follow, instead of being an independent person who can go against the grain of the algorithm, you're not ready for marriage. You're not, because you don't know who you are. <coughs> Every single one of us right now in this room, we are the product of something that has been programmed to create a reaction <coughs> in who we are. And it's a lot of money in this. So that leads you to the next three things. And how do you know who you really are? You want to identify the following. Number one is what are your non-negotiables? I'll tell you one of my non-negotiables, my wife. Nothing comes in front of my wife, not even my kids. That's dumb when people do, I love you after I love my kids. Then your kids are like, Shh. <laughs> we got this. And they start to treat one of their parents badly. But when you let kids know immediately, no, 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 you're second place, bro. You will always be second place to the queen or to my king, then you create a relationship that they know they can't box you and your relatives too. So what is a non-negotiable? My religion, my family, my honor. You wanna know what your non-negotiables are? You need to know that about yourself because if you don't, then you don't know who you are. The second thing that you wanna know is what are your negotiables? Where can you were you flexible? Were you not flexible? You have to be honest. Don't, don't create those by what you think people want because that's not honesty. If you can't be honest to yourself, how can you be honest to anyone else? And there may be bad things. It's all right, at least you're being honest. Imam Ahmed said, I would rather be with an honest sinner than a fake saint. Yeah. So at least there's integrity in that. And then the third thing is you want to think about the process needed to achieve those things. Like, how do I get there? So non-negotiables, negotiables. And the fourth, this is also a challenge, your circle of influence and your circle of concern. What does that mean? Circle of influence is my two-year-old. I can influence my two-year-old. My circle of concern is, is there water on Pluto? Like, for real? Most people, they invert it. All they talk about are things that are their concern, but they have no influence over. So they get nothing done, they get more frustrated, they get more cynical, they blame other people. But if we think about our circle of influence, what I can actually impact, and the first influence I have by the grace of God is me. That makes me become responsible. And then I prioritize those things. What are the important influences I have? 
then you think about it. What's the process of marriage? Of course, you want to make sure you're attracted to the person. There's nothing wrong with that. People are like, man, I'm going to marry someone I'm not attracted to. Are you crazy? <laughs> and you will wrong that person. You will wrong that person because you won't be good to them. And you, you don't marry a charity case. You don't marry someone because you think what they're going to be. You marry them because you are enamored with them in that moment. They have captured you. That's how it is. Don't marry a potential project. That's very demeaning to the person, too. Well, when I married you, I thought I could change you. What? Bruh? I'm not close. The second thing is you want to make istikhara. You want to turn to Allah and ask Allah for guidance. So you find the person intellectually attractive, physically attractive. You know, those kind of things are there. That's important. The second is istikhara. Ask Allah. Allah is good for me, is not good for me. The third, you want to talk to people who know you well and know that person well. You want to do your due diligence. You want to take your time. Then the fifth, you get down to the cultural stuff that you need to do in order to get the process rolling. But that, knowing who you are, your non-negotiables, your negotiables, is very important. Because that tells you if you're ready to be committed to a relationship. Relationship is hard work. Every married couple, we can all tell you, good marriages require hard work. It doesn't just happen, right? A good marriage is an investment that you put yourself into. Yep. Yes, sir. I guess while we're on this, uh, there's a famous Dr. Love. What do you say, like four things? What do you say, the four things? Or? I just want to see if this makes sense. Okay. Says for Dr. Love. You know Dr. Love? Nah, I don't know Dr. Love. Oh, that's Dr. Love right there. <laughs> <laughs> Are you Dr. Love, for real? Yeah. Huh? That's Dr. Love? No, no, no. Oh, no. man. <laughs> what are the four things Dr. Love says? Dr. Love, number one, is attractive. Uh, number two was, I think, compatible. Number three was back on check. And four was Dean. Anything about that? I mean, who am I to differ with Dr. Love? <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I would say about attractive, we need to make sure that we're realistic and not unrealistic and that we are not the outcome of a predominantly white-led aesthetic of what beauty is. Right? That we're not colonized by the construction of beauty in America as it is. Because it's not healthy. And then, and then it's like, and a, and a great sign of that is plastic surgery with respect to people who do it. Like, some people look very, very strange. Right? They look like fish. Right? <laughs> but I didn't say no names. I didn't say, hey, we're in Queens. If it was in the Bronx, I could say something even more. And of course, why well, I live in Brooklyn. But the point is, they do look like fish and roosters and stuff. And then if you look, people are like, oh my God, you look amazing. No, they don't. They don't look amazing. They look better before. Right? They do, and so, but now there's this culture of looking like a fish, <laughs> right? Which is very weird, right? The whole, I ain't gonna say no names, man. The whole Calabasas thing, the youngest one, right? Of t trying to look like, that stuff is weird, man. But then if you saw the person before, you were like, oh, mashallah. But then after, it's like, Oh, yeah, yeah, mashallah, mashallah, billah, mashallah, Allahu la ilaha wa hayu qayyum la ta'khudu hu sunatu wa la namlamu Yeah? Same thing with men. You got 16-year-old men texting me, man, I think I should get lipo, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think I should get lipo because, like, I want to have, like, abs and I'm going to start taking growth hormones. Like, growth hormone? You're 16, dude. Why do you need growth hormone at 16? You have natural growth hormone in you. Right? What happened to people? So we have to be also very careful. We talk about attractiveness. What are you attracted to? If you're attracted to a fish in the Hudson River, there's something wrong with you. Stop for a minute and back it up a little and try to lower. Your, and, and those of us that are married can tell you, man, there's beauty and there's a love that is in a lack of perfection. That's actually what makes a marriage a beautiful thing, man. That's, that really is, is what makes a relationship incredible. Because you know why? If everybody's trying to be perfect, one of the keys to a marriage is vulnerability. But we're just all like, like we're all perfect. Right now, nah, man. See, dude's doing that stuff now, man. Dude's getting eyebrows 
tattooed in their head and stuff. Like, come on, bro. Like, bro, that's weird, bro. <laughs> right? In a sense, like, just be who you are. Right? Of course, there are times when there are things like that that are needed. Don't get me wrong. I get it. I'm not saying it's all bad. I'm just saying when it's extreme and it's being driven by uncertainty. That's when it's a problem. Like, that's when it's like being driven by outside forces. That's not good, man. But when I know, okay, yeah, like, for example, sometimes people, they have like plastic surgery because they have like injuries. They may have birthmarks. They may have certain things they want to deal with, scars, whatever. Okay, I get that. That's different. But just to be dumped, like, I watched this thing about some lady on, uh, it's got to be on oxygen, who was like, yeah, I've been addicted. I spent like $2.6 million on my face. I was like, yo, you need to get a refund, you know what I'm saying? Like, like 2.6 mil, dude, like, dang, dude. Like, you know, you get a refund for real. Like, I hope you got the 30 day guarantee. <laughs> I'm sorry. And then there was a guy, her husband, he did the same thing. So between them, they spent like $4 million on their faces. I saw his face, I was like. <laughs> nah, bro, you should get that Costco warranty, bro. You could take it back anytime. Right, and then, they, and then they showed them before the $4 million worth of work. They look great. So my point is, like, when you talk about attracting this Dr. Love, who I, I respect, just because of the name. Like, we have to make sure what we're attracted to. And what makes us feel insecure? Like, do I really want to be made insecure because what people I don't even know think about me? Do whatever, bro. You know what I mean? Like. And that's why it's important to be loved. People who love you for who you are. That's a, that's a greater gift than anything you can get in life. It's people who love you for who you are. And when you're out of pocket or something needs to be corrected, okay, they may tell you, and get a little filler. But they don't tell you like, <laughs> become filled. Hopefully we're filled with love before we're filled with filter. See that bar right there? Mmm. Yeah, right? That's why they say one of the meanings of the name of Allah is something that can, you can never be satiated by it. You, one of the names of Allah, they say one of the meanings is Alaha, which you mentioned. Others say Aliha, which means something that you always want more. You can never get enough. So the dunya makes us do things to ourselves, even to damage the natural beauty that we have in order to look like white girls. Why? I'm white, I can say that. And y'all from the motherland. You know, we look at Bosnia like, like how black people look at Africa. We look at Bosnia. We're just like wearing like Bosnian medallions and stuff, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Although I'm Irish, so that's a whole nother level. But the point is, right, like why would we outsource our beauty and our aesthetic and even our culture to one predominant culture? Nah, man. So we got to be careful that what I'm attracted to. What I'm attracted to. Because you go and expect imperfection. Nah, man. What? I'm good, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Any other questions? You turned off the camera, right? No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> I can. No, I don't care. I don't care, honestly. Man, I have four children. Life's good for me. Alhamdulillah. People, whatever people want to say is all good. I got four amazing babies. MashaAllah. Anything else? Any other questions, thoughts, comments? People got nervous. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention uh, one more, just a comment more. Um, I know, like, from uh, another discussion um, that uh, I, was, I was around, you mentioned that uh, people should uh, reaffirm their shahada. Um, so um, that's something you have to privilege up, considering that you're a convert. And likewise, myself, a little bit, as far as like I was born in a Muslim family, but yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, so much as far as like growing up in a, one thing about the Bosnia, Albanian, the Balkan communities, they were the the recent generation was born into a communist system. Absolutely, and was threw out was thrown out the window. So um, I was kind of I grew up in a situation where it's like I could have done anything I wanted to. So I had also the privilege of affirming my faith, but. What would you say to people, like, just, just the, the process of, like, kind of, like, taking that certainty or kind of re retaking your shahada? I, I think the Muslim community in the world, I'm not trying to say this to get brownie points. Honestly, it has to kind of, like, reaffirm the Bosnia-Albanian experience. 
Y'all held on to y'all's deen, man. Golly, dude, like, y'all held on to your deen through everything. I mean, if communism wasn't what, bad enough, then you had the war. This brutal, right, barbaric war. I remember in Oklahoma, the Bosnians came, right? The Bosnians came to America. We were like, white Muslims? Like, really? I thought I was only white Muslims. <laughs> like, we, didn't know. we didn't know. Because of communism, we didn't really know about, unless we knew some Turks who could tell us kind of about those relationships. And there was this one Bosnian uncle, he was a painter. He was so awesome. He was just such a joyous guy, right? But he would come to Fajr, and we could smell Accra Hall in him. <laughs> so, it was like, Allahu Akbar. I was like, yo, Jannah. I, like, I, I smell Jannah, dude. You know what I mean? Like, I smell Jannah, bro. And then I was like, oh no, that's the uncle. Right? So then we went to the Sheikh, because we were young, and we thought we were really religious, and we were awesome people. Like, yo, Sheikh, Bosnian uncle, he was in his 60s. Bosnian uncle smells like cigars and alcohol, man. <laughs> and the Sheikh, he said, but he has the Noor of Fajr. Leave him alone. He has the light of Fajr. And he was like, you don't know what, so the Sheikh, because he was older, he knew history, He's like, those people been through hell, brother. He's like, the last thing you want to do is make the masjid hell for them. So like after that, I always appreciated that uncle. Right? Who like, even though he was, whatever he had, to, man, I'm sure a lot of us would turn to certain substances if we had to deal with seeing people killed and trauma. And we all been there, man. My mother died in front of me. I had been Muslim for 26 years. When I saw my mother die, I was like, yo, where the weed house? That was my, that was my, because when I was young, that's how I coped. I saw my mother die. And like, I was like, la ilaha illallah, I was like, but I got this Dr. Jekyll in me, man, that thinks it knows how to cope. So, first of all, appreciate the fact that those people, you got a masjid after all the hell you went through? Allah is great, man. Allah is great. And you talk to some of the people that saw that stuff and went through that stuff. And they will, they will remind you of Allah. What brought people through it. And imagine some of them, like you said, I met a brother in Azhar who was Bosnian who said he memorized the Quran in a, like a secret tunnel, dude. During the Russians, they would go in like secret and memorize Quran. And he said we couldn't be loud. Because, you know, it's hard to read a Quran like silent, you know what I mean? He's like, we couldn't be loud because if they heard us, we would lose everything. I met a, a Uyghur brother, may Allah freedom, whose mother sold their house for him to come to Egypt. Now you come from ancestors, number one, like historically, the Bosnians were on a whole other level, scholarship, warriors, warrioresses. But then the hell that they went through to be able to hold on to this, you, you should, that should give you strength when you're struggling in the streets of New York to know people that you come from struggle with death just because they were Muslim. And the broader Muslim community doesn't even really, unfortunately, recognize like Srebrenica and what happened. Like, it's, not, it's not unfortunately there. So that's the first thing, to think about your ancestors that you walk with your ancestors. This one time this, this black brother, he became Muslim in the masjid, and he said to me, I am the prayer of my great, great, great grandparents, dude. I was like, I started crying. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, dude, I, I, I come from a line of people that were Muslim, but then brought to this country and destroyed. So I am the dua. We wanted to name dua, but it's a girl's name. But he's like, I'm the dua of people. You are the dua, people that would thought you were going to be removed from the face of the earth. Oh Allah, preserve us, here you are. That dua is still with you today. It's walking with you wherever you go. Somebody made dua, some righteous salih was praying for you. So that will be the first thing, to like locate yourself in this historical meaning, which is so profound. And then to be patient with yourself and be patient with others, man. Don't see religion as an event, see it as a process. There's ups, there's downs. There's challenges, there's successes. And in that, 
is that sometimes you have to reaffirm your Iman. The Prophet said that the example of Iman in your heart is like new clothes that fade over time. Then he said, So ask Allah to revive your Iman. How do you revive your Iman? Go to the graveyard. Think about death. Think about your responsibility. Think about your ancestors who came before you. Think about the efforts of people around you. You and me, we're fathers, right? See your beautiful children. Being a father definitely gives you a lot more perspective, man. You know, one time my daughter was like, why don't you wake up in the morning and pray? I was like, dang. Yeah, but one day, one day she busted me, man. I was like, it's only one day. She's like, yeah, yeah, but how come I didn't hear you wake up and pray? I was like, whoa, okay. That gives you that perspective. My mother was not Muslim. My oldest came through. She's like, grandma, why don't you pray five times a day? My grandma started praying, dude. My mom's not Muslim. She said, Allah Akbar. Because <laughs> my, my daughter, right? Like, you get perspective. So learning, Allah says, Wafi and Fusikum, in you there are signs of me. From your wife, from your husband, right? All those things around us are meant to give us meaning. So what I meant by is re renewing the shahada is every once in a while just check our iman. Where's my iman at? What do we mean by iman? What choices am I making? Iman is translated by the choice. How do I live my life? And, and unfortunately, Western spirituality is like, how do I feel? <laughs> like, oh my gosh, like I prayed Fajr, but I just don't feel anything. So like, I know my Fajr is like, no good. <laughs> That's not us. If you ask those beautiful Bosnian shuhada, may Allah accept every single one of them. Amen. And you ask them when they was praying Fajr while they were being bombed, did they feel anything? That's not funny. They would have said no, but we, we worship Allah. Sheikh Ahmed Obamba was one of the great sheikhs of West Africa. He was such a great sheikh that the French kicked him out of Senegal. When they kicked him out of Senegal, they, they, they uh, like exiled him. That's what the colonials did to people. So they thought, we'll take him out because he's an influencer. Now everybody wants to be an influencer. Imagine Sheikh Ahmed Obamba in a time where there's no Instagram, there's no Facebook, there's no tech, there's no phones. Even newspapers are rare. They kick him out of Senegal because they think he'll no longer be an influencer. As he was exiting on the boat where they were exiling him, he said, I have gone from the service of people to the service of Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning being alone with Allah is better. And subhanAllah, his followers blew up more while he was gone. When he came back to Senegal, he was like, what? They were like, yeah, Sheikh, we've been waiting for you, Sheikh, fear, Sheikh. So you want to get yourself in a position where your Iman is stronger in what you don't see than what you see. And you check yourself. And, you, and especially young people, you're being pounded with this, being more influenced by what's seen or what's not seen. And that impacts the choice I make. That's why I say, La ilaha illallah. And then how do I live that? Muhammad Rasulullah. Uh, Sheikh, thank you so much, man. I love listening to you, attending the gathering and uh, conducting this halakha. Inshallah, we can continue this on a monthly basis.